Bibles, please. We'll turn to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. We will look at a couple of verses in, ver in chapter 51 just to review. On Wednesday nights, we dig into the book of Isaiah for now, and uh, usually about a chapter at a time, so I encourage you to bring your Bible. And uh, if you're not familiar with the book or with where some of the books are, I'll read all of these verses, uh, but I encourage you just to bring your Bible if you can and, and listen along. Let the Lord speak to your hearts. And uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless your word as you promised you would. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll help me to say everything you want said the way you want it said tonight. Lord, speak to our hearts. Teach us from your word. But most importantly, I pray that uh, Holy Spirit, you'll deal in our hearts, meet every need that's here, and help us to yield to you whatever you show to us tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 51, uh, verse 1, he's speaking to some people who are faithful, people who are uh, wanting to do what's right, but they're watching their nation fall apart around them. And they've, been, uh, they've seen their nation torn apart. They've seen their nation taken into captivity, many of their cities overtaken. But he encouraged them in chapter 51, those who are doing what's right, to continue doing right, to look ahead to a day when their nation would be restored. But not in the way that many have thought it would be restored, but it will be restored when the King of kings and Lord of lords is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you look at Isaiah 51, verse 1, he says, Hearken to me, listen to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Verse 4, Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. And verse 7, Hearken unto me. Ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revilings. And then we come to the very end of the chapter, and we studied this chapter last week. Verse 21, he tells them again, Therefore hear, verse 21, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. They weren't drunken with wine, they were drunken with judgment. Their nation had been destroyed. Verse 22, thus saith thy Lord the Lord, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee. He said, the nations that have been afflicting you, I'm going to afflict them. Which have said to thy soul, bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. He said, I'm going to judge those who've been judging you. If you remember the history of the children of Israel, uh, they were judged. At one time, they were slaves in Egypt, and it wasn't because of their sin. That was just God's plan for their nation. He was going to bring them out with a mighty hand to show who he was. But then later on, as the nation grew, they grew away from God, and the nation split into two. The northern kingdom became Israel. The southern kingdom became Judah. The northern kingdom was eventually taken away by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom was persecuted and then eventually taken over by Babylon. Babylon completely takes over Judah, but God promises that he's going to allow the, the Jews of Judah to return to Jerusalem. We've studied that a lot on Wednesday nights. Well, let's begin Isaiah 52 and verse number 1. He says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. He said the enemies who've been destroying you won't come into you anymore. Well, when is that going to happen? That's only going to happen when Jesus is ruling and reigning and not until then. Verse 2, he says, Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught. And ye shall be redeemed without money. They had sold themselves for nothing. What did they sell themselves for? Well, if you go back to Isaiah 50, verse 1, he says, For your iniquities have ye sold yourselves. They had sold themselves into slavery through their sin. Folks, let's remember, sin takes us farther than we want to go, keeps us longer than we want to stay, costs us more than we want to pay. Sin is like a rattlesnake. You can't play with it and not get bit. I've told this story, but it... it it's a perfect story for this. A man was climbing up a mountain. There was a poisonous snake. How many of you heard this story before? How many of you pretend you haven't heard it before? Okay, go ahead. Thanks. All right. Um, so he's climbing up this mountain. There's a poisonous snake on the ground. The poisonous snake says, give me a ride to the top of the mountain. He goes, oh, no, I'm not going to take you to the top of the mountain. You're a snake. You'll bite me. He goes, no, I won't bite you. I promise. 
So he picks him up, puts him in his backpack. He walks to the top of the mountain. When he gets to the top of the mountain, what did the rattlesnake do? He bit him. And the man's laying there dying. He says, you lied to me. You told me you wouldn't bite me. And he said, you knew what I was when you picked me up. Yeah. Folks, that's the way sin is. Sin will bring you into bondage. And God said to the children of Judah, he said, you've sold yourselves. I didn't sell you. You sold yourselves for nothing. For what? For your sin. Sin leaves you empty. And so God brought judgment upon them, but he's giving them good news. Verse 3, he says, ye shall be redeemed without money. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be bought back. If you look at Isaiah 45, go back to Isaiah 45, he tells the story how that there's going to come another king named Cyrus who's going to help deliver the Jews from Babylon. Verse 13, he says, I have raised him, Cyrus, up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, Jerusalem, and he shall let go my captives, not for price, nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. So God said, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to buy you back. It's like the story I've told about the boy in the boat. You know, maybe I should change the story. The boy in a, made a wooden car one time, okay? And the, the boy carved a, a boat, and he made this beautiful boat, and he's playing with it in the river. And one day the river caught the boat and took it away. And then one day he's walking by the toy store downtown, his little small town. He saw his boat. It was a little worse for the wear, but there it was in the toy store window. And he ran inside and he said to the toy store owner, Mr., that's my boat. That's my boat. He goes, no, son, that's my boat. I bought it a little while ago. If you want it, you have to pay for it. The boy said, well, I made it. He said, it's my boat now. So the boy went home and he worked and worked and found every chore he could and went to the neighbors and cleaned out gutters and swept sidewalks. And he came in, he dumped his coffee can on the counter and all the money was there. He said, count it, it's all there. And as he left, he had the boat in his hand. He said, you were mine once because I made you, but you're mine twice because I bought you. And that's what it means to be redeemed. We were God's once. We were created in his image. But then because of our sin, we're lost. And so we had to be bought back. Well, the picture here of Judah being bought back is simply a type of the redemption of for, for all mankind offered through Jesus Christ. What does it mean to redeem? Well, again, in the Bible, it was to redeem someone from slavery, buy them back from slavery, redeem them from being an orphan, or redeem them from widowhood. In fact, there's a whole story in the Bible dedicated to this idea of redemption. It's the story of Ruth. How many of you know the story of Ruth? In the book of Ruth, there's a kinsman redeemer. There's somebody who would buy Ruth back, so to speak. Well, to be a redeemer in the Bible, you had to, number one, be a free man yourself if you were going to redeem someone else. Can I tell you, we have a redeemer who never sinned one time. That's Jesus Christ. He did not owe a sin debt like we do. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. The kinsman redeemer had to be a free man himself. Secondly, he had to be related to whoever he was redeeming by flesh. He had to be in the bloodline. Did you know Jesus Christ, who is God, is in our bloodline? How, how so? The Bible says, For as much then as the children, speaking of us, are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. What does that mean? Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh. We, we celebrate that at Christmas time. Why did he become flesh? Why would God the Spirit come and be born as a little baby? Why? Notice the Bible says that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus came in the flesh, why? So he could suffer in the flesh for our sins. So the kinsman redeemer had to be a free man himself. Jesus was free, he never sinned one time. He had to be related by flesh. Jesus was, he was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect sinless life. But then number three, the kinsman redeemer had to be willing to pay the price of redemption. What is the price of redemption? What does it cost to buy our souls back from sin and death and hell? What does it cost? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter, it says, Ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. You can't, you can't go pay dollar bills and silver coins and gold coins to be saved. These churches that teach you can come pay some money and light some candles and people can pray you out of purgatory or pray you out of hell or pray you out of limbo. Folks, that, that, is, that is just falsehood. It's a lie. You, you, cannot be, you can't purchase your soul with money. So what does it take? What's the price that had to be paid? The Bible says you're not redeemed with silver and gold. What are you 
redeemed with if you're redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's Jesus. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The kinsman redeemer had to be a free man himself. He had to be related by flesh. He had to be willing to pay the price of redemption. And Jesus was willing to pay that price. Colossians 1.14 says, we have, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So here when God's talking about redeeming Judah, that's simply a picture looking ahead to redemption for all mankind. That's coming through Jesus Christ. So notice Isaiah 52, verse number 4. He's recounting some of the enemies who had conquered the Jews before. He says, For thus saith the Lord God, My people, the Jews, went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. What happened to them in Egypt? They were enslaved. And the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Later on, when the nation of Israel split into two, the Assyrians conquered them. Verse 5, Now therefore what have I here, saith the Lord? Now the Babylonians are persecuting them, that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually every day is blasphemed. Verse 6, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. He tells, I'm going to tell you about some redemption that's coming, Jerusalem. Now who is this redemption for? Listen, it's for every person. It doesn't matter what age, doesn't matter what nation you're from. This redemption, this salvation is for you. Notice what he quotes, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Can somebody tell me a word that means good news or good tidings? Anybody know that word? What is it? Gospel. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news, good tidings. He says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Go to Romans 10. Keep your finger in Isaiah 52. In Romans 10, he quotes what we just read. So Romans 10, he's quoting from the book of Isaiah many times actually in this chapter. But notice what he says, and this is the way of salvation. doesn't matter who you are. If you're here and you're not saved, you need to be born again. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. Notice what he says, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, on whom? On Jesus, shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Folks, what does no difference mean? It means no difference, right? There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord, Jesus, over all is rich unto all that call upon him, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I'm witnessing to somebody and I tell them, verse 13, I'll say, let's put your name right there. For whosoever, put your name right there. If you will call upon Jesus Christ, he'll save you. If you call on him in faith, believing on him, him alone, he'll save you. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now notice he's going to quote what we just read in Isaiah. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But there's a problem. When you preach the truth, not everybody believes. Not everybody listens. When Jesus preached, it doesn't matter if it's Jesus, if it's Paul, if it's you as a soul winner. When you preach and tell people the truth, one of three things happens. Number one, people say, yes, I want Jesus as my Savior. Number two, people say, you know what, I'm going to think about it and I, I want to hear this another time. Now the danger in that is you're not guaranteed you're going to live to tomorrow. But then there's a third group and that's the group that will mock and scorn and laugh about Jesus. Listen, not everybody believes it doesn't change the truth. Verse 16, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. And he's going to quote from Isaiah 53, which we're going to read next week. He says, for Isaiah, that's Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing 
by the word of God. By the way, what do you do when somebody doesn't believe your report about Jesus Christ? You try to show them the gospel or you do show them the gospel. And they say, well, I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. Well, I don't believe all that stuff about Jesus. What, what do you do? What are you supposed to do? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'll tell you what you do. You keep using the word of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God works through his word. As I've said before, you know, this is a spiritual weapon. It's a sword. It's a sword. If you take the sword out in the battlefield and somebody says, I don't believe that's a real sword. If you had, if you had an, let's say, a, a metal sword you went, took out to a battlefield and somebody says, I don't believe it's a real sword, would you pull out the manual and show them where it was manufactured and you know, show them the case it came in and how much you paid for it to prove it's a real sword? Is that what you would do? No, what would you do? You'd use it. Oh, it's a real sword, all right. What do you do when somebody says, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe it's God's word. I don't believe Jesus is the way. Can you talk to somebody like that? I've heard people say, if somebody doesn't believe that, you can't even talk to them. No, that's not true. If somebody doesn't believe that, what do you do? You seek to give them as much of the Bible as you can. Why? Because the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, and God will work through his word because the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? By the word of God. By the way, that's why it's so important when we preach and teach that our sermons, our messages are full of God's word. Not full of our experiences and lots of jokes. I, hey, I like jokes. You know, I do. I like stories. But that's not what people need. What people need is the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But not everyone believes, but some do. So when you go back to Isaiah 52, when he's talking about this redemption, he's not just talking about allowing some Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild a wall. He's talking about redemption that is for all people of all time, every nation. Now, how will God redeem Jerusalem? How will all nations see the salvation of the Lord? Look at verse 8. Again, he's speaking to Jerusalem of Isaiah 52. He says, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion, break forth into joy, sing together ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. Again, what does redeem mean? It means to buy back. We sing a song, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I'm bought back. I've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. When he's talking about redeeming Jerusalem... In the long term, what's he talking about? The salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. What does that mean? It means he's rolling up his sleeves. He's going to show his strength. He's going to reach out and save some people. Verse 10, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This isn't just for Jerusalem. It's for America. It's for every nation. Verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel will be your rear reward. How will God redeem Jerusalem? How will all nations see the salvation of our God? Here's how. And we're about to enter into one of the most Amazing scriptures in all the Bible. Absolutely one of my favorite passages. The next three verses actually belong to Isaiah 53. You know, the divisions in your Bible, it's not wrong to have them. Those are good tools. They're good tools to be able to find things. But really, the next three verses all tie, and this whole chapter does, but they especially tie together with Isaiah 53, one of my favorite chapters, which we will study next week. But notice... How is God going to redeem Jerusalem? How are all nations going to see his salvation? Here's how. Through the suffering Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb of God. Now, if we're familiar with the Bible, this may not be you know, too unique to us in one way, but I want, you to put your, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of someone who lived in Judah. They're expecting a Messiah. What's another name for a Messiah? Somebody tell me another word we use for Messiah. What is it? It's Christ, that's right. 
Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title, right? It means Messiah. It means anointed one, Jesus the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. Well, what are we talking about? An anointed one, a Messiah, Christ. What does that even mean? Well, what it means is God had promised a king. He had promised a king to Israel who would one day rule and reign from Jerusalem and rule the whole world, who would deliver Israel. Israel would be a place of power. Israel would be a place of prosperity. But when Israel and Judah split apart, when they sinned and were taken away captive, that promise of a Messiah seemed very distant. As a matter of fact, right here, they're under the thumb of the Babylonians. When you read the stories of Jesus, it's the Romans who are, have them conquered. And they're still looking for that Messiah, that Christ. What are they expecting him to do? They're expecting him to ride in on a white horse, and they're expecting him to overthrow the Babylonians. They're expecting him to overthrow the Romans. They're expecting him to set up a kingdom full of power and military might and wealth. That's what they're expecting. And it's not that God didn't tell them the other part. It's that they didn't believe it. They didn't believe God's report. They were slow to believe it. They couldn't understand how a conquering king first had to be a suffering savior. They didn't understand how the Messiah, the Christ, who's going to rule the world, first had to be the Lamb of God. Verse 13, God is absolutely speaking of Jesus Christ. He says, Behold, my servant, that's Jesus, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. What does that mean? He's high and lifted up. He's powerful. What does the Bible say in Philippians? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So they read that about the coming Messiah and said, yeah, absolutely. He'll be exalted. He'll be extolled. He'll be very high. He'll be powerful. But they didn't know that before he would be exalted, he first had to be humiliated. Before he would show himself as king of kings and lord of lords, he must first be the suffering servant. Before he came as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he must first suffer as the lamb of God. The sinless one must first become sin for us. The creator must be crucified. See, they didn't, they didn't believe that part. Jesus, when even after he'd risen from the dead, he was talking to the two of the disciples, and they didn't understand. He said, you, he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, Messiah, the King, to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He said, listen, it's been there all along. You just didn't believe it. You were slow to believe the parts that he had to suffer first. Well, verse 14, again, begins, and we'll see much more of this next week in Isaiah 53, but this servant, before he's exalted and extolled, he first has to be beaten and mocked. Notice verse 14 says, As many were astonished at thee, they were astonished. Notice, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Jesus was literally beaten so bad on that cross. That he didn't look like a man. He was not recognizable as a man. This Messiah, this King, this Christ, he'll be beaten so badly for our sins that he won't be recognizable as a man. Folks, and just let's think through that. If Jesus, look, if you could somehow, some way reform your life enough, do enough good works, be religious enough to be saved, why would Jesus have to go through that much suffering? I'll tell you why he had to go through that much suffering. He's bearing the sins of the entire world upon himself. The Bible says not only was he bearing our sins, it says he bore our sins, but it says he literally became sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It says that he became a curse for us. He is, was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. What in the world is that talking about? Well, if you read in the book of Leviticus, the high priest, to atone for sin, had to take blood, the blood of an animal. And he had to sprinkle that blood. We could look at many examples of that in Leviticus 4, 6, and 8, 11, and 14, 7. But folks, could the blood of bulls and goats ever wash away sin? 
never could. The Bible tells us, Zechariah 13, 1, in that day, what day? The day Jesus dies on the cross. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. What fountain was opened in that day? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That's the fountain that was opened. Go to Hebrews. We're going to end in Hebrews tonight. Verse 15 says, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Go to Hebrews 9. He had to sprinkle many nations with his blood. He had to offer his perfect, pure, sinless blood. Upon heaven's mercy seat for us. Look at Hebrews 9 verse 11. It says, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. For us, we're eternally redeemed, redeemed, bought back. How? By the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 22. Actually, just for more context, look at verse 20. It says, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sins without there being a blood sacrifice, without somebody paying the price for sin. Verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The rams, the goats, the lambs, those weren't good enough sacrifices. No, the heavenly mercy seat had to have perfect pure blood. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. They're just pictures of the real one in heaven. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the dead? Mary saw him. She said, Master, what did he say? It's kind of interesting why he said this. Touch me not. For I have not yet ascended unto my Father. What, what did Jesus mean? What, why did he say, touch me not, I have not yet ascended unto my Father? It's very important to understand when the high priest would go in one time a year on the Day of Atonement to offer blood on the mercy seat. And remember what the mercy seat was. Underneath there was a broken law of God. And God looking down, seeing man had broken his law, that blood sprinkled on top of the mercy seat, on top of the broken law of God, that blood would suffice for a little while but if that high priest who only the high priest could go in one time a year to offer that blood if he went in and someone touched him after he had been purified ceremonially what happened that blood was no longer pure that blood was no longer perfect in fact if you look at the high priest he had on the bottom of his robe a, a bell and a pomegranate a bell and a pomegranate if they didn't hear the bell still ringing he was dead you know, the fact is, the blood had to be perfect. It could not be tainted. When Jesus rose from the dead, and he said to Mary, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. What was Jesus doing? He was taking his literal blood and offering it on the mercy seat in heaven to cover our sins. That's where Hebrews 10, verse 12 says, This man, after he would offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever 
them that are sanctified. Aren't you thankful in Jesus Christ? You're justified. You're perfect. You're sanctified through the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're washed clean through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're redeemed. We're bought back because of the price he paid. Next week we'll see Isaiah 53. We already saw Isaiah 52. It says Jesus was beaten so badly couldn't even recognize him. Isaiah 53 gets into the specifics of how he suffered on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed for a moment. Jesus did pay the price for our sins. I wonder who would say, Pastor, I know for sure if I died today I'd go to heaven. Jesus has paid my way. And I've trusted him and only him as my Savior. And I know I'm saved. I know my sins are forgiven. If that's you as you lift your hand, I know I'm saved. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Is there anyone tonight, anyone at all, you'd say, Pastor, the truth is, the truth is, if I were to die today, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not 100% sure I'm saved, but I sure would like to be. Anyone at all, would you lift your hand if that's you? Anyone at all? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you just thank God again, Christian, for the price Jesus paid for you? You know, we, we had a great week of seeing folks saved but let's, let's not let up. There are people this week, there are souls this week, we're going to meet that need to hear the gospel. There'll, there'll never be an end. There'll never be an end of the need for souls to be saved. So let's be faithful soul winners this week. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Anyone else who would say, Pastor, the truth is, if I died today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. I want to be saved. Anyone at all? Would you lift your hand right now? Lift it up. Anyone at all? God bless you. See your hand. See your hand. We want to help you with that. Could I have a man with a Bible, please? Could I have a man with a Bible? Could you help me, Brother Buster? Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who else? Anyone else? Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Please pray for me. There's no end to the need, folks. I think, of, I think ahead to the Ladies' Fellowship and Mission Sunday and Mother's Day and the Spring Festival and the parade, you know, we're, we're literally going to come into contact in, in every regular service. We're going to come into contact with thousands of people over the next few weeks. We need to be ready with the gospel in our hearts, the gospel in our lips. We need to be ready with a gospel track. We, we need to be ready. We need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We just read in Isaiah tonight and in Romans 10, he quotes it again. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings. How are your feet? How are your spiritual feet? Are you ready to bring the gospel to someone else? Heavenly Father, bless your word to our hearts tonight. Thank you for it. Put a hedge about us as we go our separate ways. Bless our time of prayer to follow, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.